So our, our second speaker is Curtis Dozier. Uh, Curtis is visiting assistant professor of Greek and Roman studies at Vassar College. He has published a series of academic articles on Quintilian's Institutio Oratoria, and his other work has appeared on Salon.com, Adelon, and Public Radio's Academic Minute. He is the director of Pharos, doing justice to the classics, a site that documents and responds to appropriations of antiquity by hate groups and has just launched The Mirror of Antiquity, a podcast in which classical scholars reflect on the intersections between their research and their own lives and contemporary culture. So Curtis. Thank you, Alan, for that introduction and to the program committee for the invitation to this uh, very interesting panel. Let me just call up my uh, slides here. During the last three uh, presidential elections, I've taught a course called Classical Rhetoric in the Presidential Campaign, where we read ancient theories of persuasion and ask what perspective they give us on what the candidates are doing on, and saying. And uh, today, what I want to tell you about is what I observed in my students when I taught this course uh, last year during the uh, Clinton-Trump race. Because I've observed, and this is, I've observed what uh, Alan asked us to think about in, the, in his introduction. I've observed that encountering classical rhetorical theory simultaneously with the partisanship, special interests, and 24-hour news cycle of American politics helps my students, who are themselves deeply partisan and even prejudiced against their political opponents, which on my campus at least is the Republican Party, it helps, it helps my students start becoming the kinds of citizens that I think this country needs. In short, they start to abandon their complacent, even smug conviction that truth is on their side against their opponents' reprehensible distortions, and they begin to take responsibility for actively and vigorously making arguments for the things that they believe are right. In particular, I want to encourage you to develop a course like this at your institution too. I've put a detailed syllabus online for you to start with if you'd like. Uh, it's also on my Twitter feed. And I actually wasn't an expert in classical rhetoric when I taught this class for the first time. It actually works really well if you learn as you go. If one day you read something ancient and then the next day you ask the students to find and bring in and discuss examples from the campaign that uh, intersect with what you've, what you've been reading. And the list of things that we realized that fall about Trump and Clinton and American politics is far too long to cover in the short time I have here. But when you read Aristotle defining anger as a desire accompanied by pain for revenge for one of three forms of belittling, contempt, spitefulness, and insolence, and when Aristotle goes on to say that insolence is the doing or saying of things that bring shame to the person who suffers them, and then Hillary Clinton is reported as saying, out of context to be fair, but nevertheless reported to have said, you know, just to be grossly generalistic, you could put half of Trump's supporters into what I call a basket of deplorables, right? You've got a textbook example. I mean, that's Aristotle's textbook. You have a textbook example of something that Aristotle could have predicted would produce anger and a desire for revenge. Now, Clinton, of course, was trying to produce what Aristotle calls philia, sometimes called friendly feeling, which Aristotle says exists between people who think the same things are good and bad. And I'm sure she did create that feeling in her supporters. But the same remark turned out to be rhetorically very useful for Trump and his campaign to create anger in theirs. And every single day, the students found intersections like this between what the ancients wrote and what the candidates were doing. When I, when I tell people I'm teaching this course, they usually assume one of two things about it. They, they either assume I'm comparing Republican candidates to Athenian demagogues or Roman emperors, or if they, if they know a little more about rhetorical theory, they assume I'm, we're finding figures of speech in the, in the candidates' uh, language. 
But studying rhetoric is not just about historical analogies or, or the surface features of language. It's about how political arguments are made and how they're won. And, when, and in particular, th this year that I taught it, when I told people we're reading Aristotle and Trump together, they would often scoff at the idea that Aristotle could be relevant to anything that Trump said. But even incoherent ramblings make an ethical appeal. The classical theories are capacious and flexible enough to describe almost anything the candidates might say. And this is one reason it's such a great class, because it's a really powerful demonstration of the continuing relevance of, of classics to our contemporary world. It's also a powerful way to examine your own political assumptions. Knee-jerk partisanship comes from, in part, demonizing our opponents and their supporters. And at the start of the semester, this is how many of my students approach the campaign. But once they start looking for the techniques Aristotle describes, they realize that both sides are using rhetoric, both the side they support and the side they abhor. And they end up discovering that in terms of the rhetorical techniques that the candidates are willing to use, the two sides aren't as different as they seem. Related to this, and um, more significantly, I think, students studying rhetoric have to give up the comforting but false belief that their side relies purely on facts and logic, while the other side deploys deceptive and manipulative emotions like fear and anger. Now, Aristotle invented formal logic, so he knew that it is possible to make arguments using only facts. But in the rhetoric, he recognizes that facts alone are never enough to decide the kinds of arguments we deliberate about in politics. Whether we should build a wall on the Mexican border can't ultimately be decided solely on the basis of facts and logic. It depends on what vision we have for our country, what kind of economy we think is just or beneficial, how we conceive of citizenship and human rights, and so on. These values are the always debatable premises that without calling them values, Aristotle never, nevertheless recognizes underlie political arguments, premises or values which speakers are usually at pains to conceal. Learning to identify and articulate these premises is a huge benefit of studying rhetoric. So, so is realizing with Aristotle that speakers, all speakers, convince an audience to accept these debatable premises, not with logic, but with emotions and appeals to virtues. It's not for nothing that the rhetoric gives as much space to logical arguments as to emotional and ethical ones. Aristotle understood that they go hand in hand, and there's no such thing as a purely rational political claim. Too few on the left understand this, I think. A lot of us think that because the facts are on our side, our side should or will win. But what the fact checkers call lies are usually just arguments whose concealed premises are so outrageous that very few people would accept them. But this is a difference in degree from what they call truths, not a difference in kind. I'm not saying there are no facts, but I do think Aristotle understood that in politics at least, facts don't mean very much until they're embedded into rhetorical structures. So the idea of a fact-based as opposed to a, a rhetorical politics is a red herring, and indeed itself is a rhetorical pose. The result of studying rhetoric in this way is a distancing of yourself from your own assumptions, preferences, and convictions. You recognize they are beliefs, not eternal truths, and that these beliefs are the product of persuasion that has been applied to you. My students start to recognize, for example, the rhetorical techniques that the political commentaries and memes that they follow on social media are applying to them. They also start to see that the, the other side in a new light. Before my class, a lot of my students had never actually looked carefully at anything Trump had said. And as they learned to describe how he argues in Aristotelian terms, they started saying things like, I really hate what he's saying, but I can see why he's persuasive. But their critique of him also becomes so much sharper than it had been at the beginning of the semester because rhetorical analysis is a way to take your opponent's arguments seriously without saying that all arguments are equal. You learn to identify and name the weaknesses, and you understand why an argument with an outrageous or offensive premise might nevertheless carry the day. And ideally, you start thinking about how such arguments might be countered. However, this isn't just a class in undermining our own certainties. As the students develop a deeper understanding of the other side's appeal and become less contemptuous of the other side's supporters, they also become energized to advocate in favor of policies and points of view that align with their beliefs about what is just or beneficial. I always teach Plato's critique of the sophists as part of the class, and the students pretty easily recognize that Plato's representations of the sophists is rhetorically constructed. And most of my students start to recognize that partisanship 
is a fundamentally platonic position, a certainty about the eternal and unchanging truth of one's ultimately unverifiable or unprovable position. And this realization creates some uncomfortable moments when students realize that the things they believe, for example, that the interpretation of the Constitution should evolve as culture evolves, that income inequality is a problem, that women should have control of their bodies, that all human beings are equal, are beliefs, not facts. And this is where the sophists start to become useful because they seem to have believed that something is only real if you can convince someone it's real. Now Plato has convinced us, and I use that term advisedly, that this is the position of sinister charlatans and demagogues. But after Trump won, my students saw his partisans asserting the fundamental and unchanging truth of their positions. And they saw that the line between platonic certainty and rhetorical pose that's useful to those who are currently in power is a very blurry one indeed. In their discomfort about their own prior certainty compared to that of Trump's voters, my students found a new commitment to stand up for their beliefs, to advocate for them, to make the argument for them, because they saw that if they don't do that, the other side is going to win, no matter how sure we are of the truth and justice of our position. For me, what came out of, my, out of that class last year is my site, Ferris, doing, to the, doing Justice to the Classics, which uh, Alan referred to in his introduction, where I and my research assistants document and invite scholars to respond to appropriations of ancient Greece and Rome by hate groups. I hope you'll check out the site at pharaohsclassics.org and follow us on social media. Since I launched it, I've gotten some criticism for the ideological approach we're taking, which is to articulate in opposition to racist and misogynistic interpretations of the past, of way of study, a way of studying classics that serves progressive politics. But what's the alternative? The past, especially a fragmentary one like the one we study, and this is what the papyrus fragment in our logo is supposed to represent, a fragmentary past will mean whatever we can persuade people it means. My colleague, uh, Professor Padilla Peralta, is gonna talk in a few minutes about the search for reasons to study antiquity. These reasons, if we can find them, are going to be arguments. And like any argument about anything important, they're going to have to be rhetorical. If we focus only on what's verifiable and logically airtight, we won't be able to say very much about the meaning of the past. And if, the, if we leave the meaning of the past to the racists, they're gonna make it serve their aims. And for the longevity of our discipline, and for the good of the world, we can't allow that to happen. Thank you. <laughs>